Number 5. Morality. As humans, we are able to act beyond our instincts. There are certainly herd instincts and tribal taboos within the animal world, but nothing that compares with human morality. So, do I take it that Brooks understands that human morality is just a more complex version of the same phenomenon that we can clearly observe in non-human animals? Oh, well, I mean, it's nice and all, but why is it here, then? The best way to illustrate this wide gap is through a pet hamster we owned. It was an exciting event when that hamster had babies. My kids were so excited and gave each of them a name. A few weeks later, tragedy struck. We woke up one morning to find one of the baby hamsters missing. For a moment, we searched frantically to try and locate the missing hamster. But then the unthinkable became apparent. The mother had eaten one of her babies. I was outraged. Needless to say, that was the last hamster we ever owned. My God. This personal anecdote is not only completely pointless, it is also so dull and badly written that I am amazed that any editor was able to approve it without experiencing guilt-based nightmares for the rest of their life afterwards. What's funnier, though, is that what happened was more than likely the fault of Brooks himself and his family. Hamsters cannibalizing their litter isn't some sort of a random act of evil, it's a carefully planned survival strategy. So mothers eating their pups is a result of their assessment of the capacity of the environment to support the whole litter. In other words, they try to guess whether there's enough food, space, or way too many perceived dangers. If it happened right after birth, it could have been just the reaction to a genetic abnormality in the baby hamster, but the time frame so helpfully provided by Brooks makes it unlikely. There are also rumors that mothers can eat their pup if they are unable to recognize it by smell because someone else handled it, but I couldn't find any serious non-anecdotal evidence, and unlike Brooks, I wouldn't make claims based on anecdotes. Lastly, there is a possibility of a pup dying for unrelated reasons and the mother eating it to protect herself and the rest of her litter from predators who would be attracted to the stench of decay otherwise. This happens a lot. The moral framework can be seen in virtually every culture. For instance, nearly all people groups recognize the importance of honesty, honoring property, and respecting the marriage covenant. These values do not correspond well with the Darwinian drive to out-survive one's neighbors. However, they are consistent with the view that all people are the result of a loving God who wishes for people to live in harmony. Do they not correspond well now? Because the only person stumped to explain their correspondence seems to be Brooks himself. It's probably because of his childish oversimplification of the theory of evolution. Out surviving one's neighbors, really? Well, it might be a shock to him, but the success isn't measured in just surviving alone. After all, you might out survive all your neighbors, but left alone your genetic lineage will end, unless you can magically reproduce asexually all of a sudden. We also know that cooperation is a key survival mechanism seen in species from bacteria and ants to us, and cooperation, by definition, requires someone else. For us and our closer relatives, however, cooperation isn't based on a simple instinct, but on trust. In other words, on the assumption of reciprocity. This is why it's bad to lie and take other people's stuff. They stop trusting you, since they can't know for sure what to expect from you or they know for sure that they cannot expect reciprocity when they do something for you. Obviously, this explanation does not cover the entire topic, for instance, the existence of altruism, but it does apply quite well to the issues of not breaking the basic moral principles. And guess what? We have examples of animals behaving according to this idea, displaying the drive for cooperation and reciprocity, and guided by empathy, from chimps walking together even when one of them has no immediate personal benefit, to them consoling the angry or sad individuals, to them demanding equal pay for the same task and even refusing to accept a better payment if the other individual gets a worse one. Of course, we also have examples of animals lying and cheating to get what they want. So that paints a picture that is way too close to our morality for it to be considered a serious enough difference. I would also like to mention that I did notice the not-so-subtle placement of weasel words liberally sprinkled in Brooks' assertions. And that's not surprising at all, since even a cursory search of Wikipedia and some historical perspective would clearly show that clarifying it with the qualifiers like nearly all instead of all was necessary for it to not be a flat-out lie. In fact, 
neither of the values mentioned are universal and exist in all cultures in the same way, and in some they don't exist at all, which kind of contradicts the idea of an all-powerful god that guides all people equally, unless this god has some issues with his omnipotence not quite working in some regions of the globe. And lastly, you should notice that this part, unlike the previous ones, didn't even have a quote mined from someone in an attempt to appeal to their authority. In fact, it has no sources whatsoever supporting it this time, which isn't too surprising given that the argument from morality has long moved into the realms of philosophical apologetics, where pesky things such as reality are supposed to give under the weight of the logic of the apologists. And that is because no self-respecting scientist with the relevant expertise would make a mistake of trying to argue for it, given what we currently know.